Welcome back, everyone, to our AADMD virtual conference. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next plenary speaker. And I uh, hope everyone had a chance to go to the exhibit hall and check out all our wonderful sponsors. I learned quite a, bit, a few things and almost late coming back here. But uh, we have a, a wonderful speaker next that's going to uh, uh, entertain us and educate us. Uh, we learn things from history. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Rick Rader, director of the Habitation Center at the Orange Grove Center in Chattanooga, where he's responsible for the creation, implementation, and evaluation of innovative and novel programs of healthcare delivery systems for people with intellectual and developmental disability. He is also the editor-in-chief of Exceptional Parent Magazine and has published over 300 articles in our field. He is a VP of Public Policy and Advocacy at the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, serves on the board of the American Association on Health and Disability. He is a member of the Medical Advisory Committee at Special Olympics uh, International and is a medical advisor at the National Task uh, Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices. He's an adjunct faculty of Human Development of the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, a past president of AADMD, and our one of our founders of AADMD in his own kitchen. And that's another story. Um, he is a, a wealth of knowledge. He knows more things than you'll ever imagine. He's gonna give us a great insight to our history of our heroes in the foundation of developmental medicine. Uh, my friend and yours, Dr. Rick Bader. Okay, Courtney, are we advancing the slides? Okay. Okay, so, so much for technology. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wong. Um, welcome to the ninth episode of Foundations in Developmental Disabilities. Um, it's where we examine the significant contributions of clinicians in our non-specific, non-specialty specialty. This series was created to answer the barrage of questions we receive from medical and dental students, residents, bean counters, medical educators, colleagues, families, and even individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Where did you learn to do what you do? And it was, and it is a great question. How and where do we learn about what we do in an environment where there were no courses, no lectures, no clerkships, no residencies, no fellowships, no patients, no guidelines, no shoes to fill, no mentors, no textbooks, no journals, no exams, no societies, no specialty, and sadly, no expectations. And so we set out to figure that out. And with no surprise, we found several answers. First and foremost, to borrow from the popular dorm room post from the 60s, everything we needed to learn, we learned in kindergarten. It was there we learned about sympathy, empathy, pity, underdogs, bullying, stigmatizing, inclusion, the haves and the have nots, and what it was like to be picked to play or picked to play last or not picked at all. Of course, we learned from our friends across the aisle, the developmental and behavioral pediatricians, thanks to Bob Cook, Alan Crocker. Certainly we learned from families and without a doubt from the patients and certainly from each other. There is a group we have termed the AADND heroes. Those clinicians, not necessarily directly in the field of developmental medicine because there was none, but in their own fields, in their own ways, often on their own terms. They practiced medicine in ways that resonated with us and encouraged us to replicate, mirror, adopt and embrace their style their values and their sensitivities. Each year for the past eight years, we have added a new AADND hero to the roster. The keynotes describe the heroes, their accomplishments, their beliefs, their teachings, and why we selected them. The concept of foundations in developmental medicine are based on the insights of Thomas Monson when he shared, we tend to become like those we admire. The AADME heroes are clinician leaders that we admire. For those of you who are new to this tradition, let me offer you a brief summary of our previous AADND heroes. For others, it will be an opportunity to be reacquainted with old friends. Sir William Osler, known as the Doyen of medical education, he created bedside teaching to medical students. He introduced the idea that physicians need patients and not lectures to learn about empathy. 
The current medical residency model is based on his teaching approach. He showed us that the patients, not the professors, were our greatest teachers. Dr. Bob Cook, one of the pioneers in developmental pediatrics, he was selected by President John F. Kennedy to become the first medical director of the President's Committee on Mental Retardation. He also started the Head Start program. He shared to me that his greatest accomplishment was to get the pediatric residents at the Johns Hopkins Hospital to stop referring to children with unknown etiologies as GORKS, G-O-R-K-S, an acronym for God only really knows. He showed us that running good programs does not require you winning the popularity contest. Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, Hungarian physician who years before the germ theory advocated for hand washing and saved thousands of lives of women who were dying of childbirth fever. He was ridiculed, discredited, and forgotten. It's somewhat ironic since that we are now in the throes of COVID pandemic, that hand washing is one of our most greatest medical preventative strategies. He showed us that having new ideas, even, even evidence-based new ideas is no guarantee to acceptance, approval, and support from a stale concrete thinking medical profession. So Archibald McIndoe, the maverick pioneer plastic surgeon who restored the severely burned faces of young British pilots during the Battle of Britain in World War II. He advocated for their inclusion into society during their recovery. His 600 plus patients became known as the guinea pig club for the unorthodox and experimental procedures he provided. All of them went on to live productive lives after the war. He showed us how being stigmatized based on physical defects can impact on the acceptance of individuals and how clinicians need to appreciate the need for inclusion as part of the road back from life-changing events and impairments. Another lesson for us too, when necessary, buck the system, press on and don't wait around for obstacles to appear because surely they will. So Ludwig Gutmann, a German physician who escaped Nazi persecution and fled to England, where he was put in charge of rehabilitating spinal cord injured soldiers, the position no other physician wanted. He observed how the wheelchair-based patients responded to being encouraged to create and participate in sports and games within their capabilities. He capitalized on their physical rehabilitation as well as the impact on their psychosocial health. His work led to the creation of the Paralympics and showed us how important it is for individuals with disabilities to be encouraged to work around their impairments and utilize their skills and abilities. Sir Frederick Treves, the British surgeon who was the physician to Joseph Merrick, known as the Elephant Man. He promoted the idea that in addition to medical care, stigmatized patients need socialization, inclusion, dignity, and certainly acceptance. He showed us that not only the patients needed to feel valued by society, but society reaped the benefits by offering acceptance and inclusion. Dr. Albert Schweitzer, a remarkable icon of dedication, service, and champion of the underserved. A talented musician, he gave up his career to set up a medical clinic in remote Africa. He trained many healthcare professionals in how to succeed with limited resources. He promoted the concept of the sanctity of life. He showed clinicians the need for both giving and receiving. Schweitzer has influenced countless physicians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals how serving the underserved can empower them and fortify their personal and professional persona. Last year's AADM Hero was a milestone for the AADMD as we welcomed the first female physician into the so-called boys club. Dr. Virginia Apgar was not only an advocate for neonatal care, but created a score that monitored the health status of newborns and with it, the clinical approach to ensuring their safety and survival. She literally created the specialty of clinical neonatology advanced the science of anesthesiology, reduced infant mortality by leaps and bounds, and want, went on to a distinguished career as the medical director of the March of Dimes, as well as a pioneer in promoting vaccinations. Her legacy was best described by a famous physician who said, every baby born in a modern hospital anywhere in the world is looked at first through the eyes of Virginia Apgar. She earned her place as an AADME hero. While there is an abundance of medical icons that have contributed to the foundations of developmental medicine, I decided to go out on a limb for this year's profile. It gives me great pleasure to present Marcus Welby, MD. The reason why this is an out of the box selection is because Dr. Welby is not a real doctor. In fact, he's not a real life person, period. Marcus Welby was the character of a TV hit show that ran from 1969 to 1976. What possible contribution to the way we understand, perceive, and evolve the specialty of developmental medicine could a fictitious Hollywood-created TV character 
have on how we teach, mentor, and encourage clinicians to treat patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Like all of our past AADMD heroes, his contribution is by being a role model, by his behavior, by his attitudes, his empathy, his problem solving, and his understanding of the novel, different, and unique ways that illness, disabilities, impairment, and pain affect and impact the lives of individuals. Let me give you a plug to the significance of TV doctors and how they have influenced our view on the doctor-patient relationship. From the early days of television, the public has been captivated by an abundance of drama series featuring physicians. Since the early 1950s, there have been over 100 TV doctor shows with several hundred different doctors appearing in millions of homes each week. These doctors help form our impressions about the nature of physicians. They influence our feelings about how we wanted doctors to treat us, what we could expect from the best ones, how to rate their bedside manner and their humanity, and of course, their skills, knowledge, and competence, as well as their limitations and frailties. Of particular significance is that they motivated and influenced generations of young people who thought, hey, I want to be a doctor. While most of you were not alive to watch Marcus Welby, MD, Many of you probably were familiar perhaps with reruns of more contemporary shows like Grey's Anatomy, ER House, MASH, St. Elsewhere, Doggy House, MD, Chicago Med, The Resident, The Nick, and The Good Doctor. Of course, we're still waiting for a new series to be called DD Docs, and maybe that will happen. Marcus Welby, MD, aired on ABC for seven seasons from September 1969 until 1960 with Robert Young in the title role. Okay, a star on the silver screen and best known for his role as Jim Anderson on Father Knows Best, the 62 year old returned to television after a seven year retirement to play Welby. The plot of the hour long weekly series revolved around the medical cases of Dr. Marcus Welby, MD, a kind hearted family doctor who ran his office out of his home in Santa Monica, California, and was associated with our family practice center at Lang Memorial Hospital. Welby had an old school work ethic and treated his patients with respect. After suffering a mild coronary, Welby hired a younger associate, Dr. Stephen Kiley, James Brolin, to help him with his workload. Unlike the conservative Welby, Dr. Kil Kiley was a handsome ladies man who rode his motorcycle to make house calls. It's not working. Although a generation gap existed between Kiley and Welby, the two doctors shared the pa same patient-centered care approach. Much of the appeal of the program surfaced in the way that Welby treated his patients. In 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Medicare bill, raising many questions about the degree and quality of health care offered in the United States. Americans hey, worried. Dr. Rader, I'm so sorry. If you just click in the, the box, you should be able to control the slides again. Which box? Just click anywhere on your presentation. Like the, there you go. You're controlling it now. Sorry about that. Okay, great. Um, so much of the appeal of the program surfaced on the way that Welby treated his patients. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Medicare bill, raising many questions about the degree and quality of healthcare offered in the United States. Americans worried that they were going to be lost in the bureaucracy of the medical system and that their health would suffer for it. Marcus Welby allied those fears of depersonalization. Although Dr. Welby was supposed to be a general practitioner, he treated much more than the common cold. The program spearheaded medical issues that raised social, moral, and ethical questions. Welby, Welby and Kylie treated patients with sickle cell anemia, autism, drug addiction, organ transplants, leukemia, LSD, and what was then known as mental retardation. Marcus Welby, MD, even dealt with issues such as abortion, and interracial marriages, both controversial topics. Both controversial uh, topics. Um, Marcus L. Welby, MD, was the top television show during the 1970-1971 season and continued to win a plethora of awards, including a Golden Globe for the best television drama and an Emmy. Marcus Welby did not go unnoticed by the medical profession Many doctors liked him for portraying medicine in a positive light. They enjoyed the positive profile the series put on physicians. The show did not portray doctors as arrogant, selfish, self-centered, incompetent, or uncaring. 
On the other hand, many physicians disliked Welby in the show because they felt he was setting them up for failure, for not being able to meet their expectations of their patients. Unlike Welby, real life physicians could not diagnose conditions other doctors missed. They couldn't treat and cure them, hold their hands, decide not to bill them and train their pet beagles all in less than an hour. The humanitarian exploits of Dr. Welby spurned idiomatic expressions, Will, like he's no Marcus Welby MD. At the time, medical students and residents were challenged and quizzed on teaching rounds by the attendings asking questions such as, well, what would Marcus Welby do in this situation? The term Marcus Welby syndrome was applied to patients who idolized their physicians, left medical decision-making entirely up to the physician and never questioned them about alternative treatments or sought second opinions. Welby was the face of the recruiting poster for general practice, which evolved into family medicine. Welby elevated the reputation, attraction, and significance of general practice at a time when most physicians were attracted to become specialists. While the American Academy of Family Practice was established in 1947, it wasn't until 1969 that the American Board of Medical Specialties approved family practice as a new specialty. It took 22 years for general practice to be recognized as a specialty and as a reason for going into medicine. It's an interesting and intriguing sidebar that in 1977, the year after the Marcus Welby left the air, George Engel, the American psychiatrist, conceptualized the biopsychosocial model of medicine, suggesting that to understand a person's medical condition, it is not simply the biological factors to consider, but also the psychological and social factors, a theme that was played out weekly on Marcus Welby, MD. It's not, uh, it's not a coincidence, perhaps, that George Engel spent his career at the University of Rochester, and maybe, maybe he learned a thing or two from our own Dr. Dr. Sulkis. The show had won more than 30 awards from medical groups, including several specialty societies, and Young was consistently asked to address physicians' meetings. At the 1971 convention of the AAFP, the star Robert Young was not only a speaker, but clearly the hero of the meeting. He was pursued by the attendees seeking autographs to display in their office. Here is what a physician critic reported in an article in 1972. When eagle-eyed Welby notices that a retarded girl reverses some of her letters, he suspects the diagnosis of dyslexia is secondary to brain damage, has his hunch confirmed by a specialist, and refers the patient to a center for learning disabilities. Welby says, training may not make her normal, but it will allow her to reach her fullest potential. Pretty potent stuff from a GP in the early 70s. Hopefully we can't forgive him for remarking, training may not make her normal. Another physician who watched the show reported in a journal, quote, there was a lovely episode last year about a retarded child in a migrant Oki family. Kylie, the protege hired by Welby, discovers that the child is deaf, probably not retarded. The child's father has rejected the child and refuses to let him go for a treatment clinic despite his wife's pleas. The mother persists and in a beautiful scene communicates with her son for the first time. The child is wearing space age earphones to magnify every sound. The mother sings a folk lullaby. The father softens, begins to cooperate in the long process of teaching the child to speak. His own business is explained as stemming in part from guilt about his son's condition, in part from the hopes he had had from his own illiterate father that someday the family would achieve education. As most physicians wish, they could not only successfully treat the disease, but also reconnect family ties provide hope for the future, and do it in 48 minutes and 50 seconds. Physicians at the time were surveyed and confessed that they were influenced by watching the show. Interestingly enough was that they wanted their own physicians to treat them like Welby and were motivated to treat their patients more Welby-like too. One physician critic remarked that Marcus Welby was a fantasy. He said, the way Welby carries on, you'd think he had nothing to do but take care of one patient a day. That was the commonest criticism of the show by doctors. The critics went on to say, Welby and Kylie seem to be running a two-man intensive care unit in which they not only attend to their patients' medical problems, but take them to the ball games, serve them elaborate dinners, stop by their jobs, and attend their weddings. America is now expected their doctors to drive them to the hospital, adjust the oxygen, sit with them through the night, and stand by in the operating room for three hours when the surgeon does his magic. The reality is that I know a lot of AADMD colleagues 
who treat individuals with IDDD and their families often do those things. And maybe that's part of the joy of working with our population. Developmental medicine not only encourages well-being like relationships, it's part of the attraction. It's one of the rewards that continuously provide a return on the investment, an investment of our time, our energy, curiosity, our training, our advocacy, and our commitment. Being Marcus Welby MD at any time would be taxing, challenging, and obstacle filled, but being Marcus Welby MD in the current climate of medical practice might be a pipe dream, but embracing elements of his style is worth the pursuit. Even spending 48 minutes and 50 seconds with a single patient is a challenge. Throw in the realities of our patients, realities that would challenge a team of Hollywood script writers who would have been instructed to incorporate what we deal with, behavioral, sensory, communication, mobility, psychiatric, emotional, cognitive, and immune deficits, and see how well they would stack up before the last commercial break. The clinicians of the AADMD pride themselves not always on achieving success, because it's typically elusive, but pride themselves by coming back for more, coming back with new enthusiasm, new ideas, new approaches, new knowledge, new collaborations, new resources, and new hopes. While people with disabilities have become more common on television in recent years, the largest population of them were historically seen on medical dramas. Research shows that media are more effective at formulating stereotypes about groups when audiences exposure to that group is limited. While Marcus Welby, MD, Ben Casey, and Dr. Kildare reflected how we wanted our own personal physicians to take care of, what about today's television docs? How do they stack up? We researched episodes of ER, Grey's Anatomy, and House MD, and examined how interactions between patients and physicians are portrayed by these TV docs. The study looked at certain factors when examining interactions, including empathy, eye contact, active listening, courtesy, humor, social and casual conversations, self-disclosure, and cultural respectfulness. Results show that television physicians engage in many patient-centered communication behaviors, such as active listening, information exchange, immediacy behaviors, and cultural respectfulness. On the other hand, they really engage in some other important behaviors also considered patient-centered, such as helping patients navigate the healthcare system by removing obstacles they may face in accessing or receiving treatment, patient education, and supported decision-making. The purpose of most episodes of Marcus Welby MD was not to illustrate the clinical aspects of a particular disease or its treatment. Most of the stories were about how disease affects people and how a wise and caring physician can help his patients, even in situations where there is no cure to be offered. Okay, so let's not forget that this was TV drama at its heights. There was one episode where Welby used a car battery to deliver a shock to a patient's heart. Hollywood its best. But let's not forget that the fibrillation and cardioversion were relatively new inventions. It's obvious that doctors in 1969 had less advanced tests and treatments to offer their patients than we have today. But the ironic thing is that Marcus Welby's patients got a lot more in a way because of his exceptional personal involvement, his passion and courage. In that sense, the shows are totally refreshing. Medicine today, with its focus on guidelines and measurable data, has become a rather faceless bureaucracy, with physicians being forced to become technicians and autocrats. 52 years after the first season of Marcus Welby, MD, there are lessons we have to learn or be reminded of. Let's look at the qualities parents look for in a physician to treat their children with special health care needs. And when I say children, that's children of all ages, including seniors with intellectual disabilities, we now have parents in their 80s and their children with IDDD are in their 60s. So a physician who sees past the disability was one of the first things that the parents noted. They look for providers who interact well with their child. A tuned in doctor can sense when the patient feels well and when he doesn't. Medical recommendations are often better because they aren't based on the diagnosis alone. They also look for a physician with good bedside manner Patients obviously want to communicate with the physician, as do parents, but once the exam begins, the conversation should shift from physician to parent to the physician and patient, despite any doubts in the patient's communicative abilities. They want a physician who is readily available. With respect for the physician's time, parents also need the physician to respond with requests for prescriptions or a letter of medical necessity to order equipment. 
Sometimes parents forget to ask questions at an office visit. They need a physician who is available for follow-up. They want a physician who is open-minded. The art of healing comes from nature, not from the physician. Therefore, the physician must start from nature with an open mind. Parents are always brainstorming, researching, reading, and finding new types of therapy. They are not second-guessing the doctor when they bring these out-of-the-box ideas to light. They are simply advocating for their children, and they need an open-minded doc to at least listen. They want a physician who shares their joy. Patients with special health care needs do not typically have recognizable or timely accomplishments. When parents share these milestones with the doctor, they want the physician to acknowledge, celebrate, and show encouragement and joy for the advancement, even if it's minuscule. So what are we learning from Dr. Welby? What exactly are the contributions of Dr. Marcus Welby to the foundations of developmental medicine that would make him worthy of being admitted to the class of 2021? Well, for one thing, encourage new blood by becoming a mentor, a role model, strive to identify promise and talent. Don't feel pressured to jettison old practices just because they're old. Discard old ways if they are no longer productive, but protect and promote values, vision, intuition, and smarts. Continue and refine as needed things that have worked, do work, and will probably continue to work. Realize that while medicine is a team sport and interdisciplinary, in the exam room, bedside, or in a patient's world, it's you and the patient in a singular sacred duet. Realize it's where you can shine, perform, and connect and make someone's day including your own. Challenge convention. Don't go with the flow if the flow is circling the drain. By your actions, attitudes, and acceptance, leave the patient thinking that he or she was the only patient you saw that day. Understand that there is always something to offer, even though you had hoped to offer more. When shaving or applying lipstick in the morning, look in the mirror and repeat the words, of Francis Weld Peabody, the Harvard physician who in 1927 said, one of the essential qualities of the clinician is an interest in humanity for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And certainly when you can be a star on your own TV show. And so on behalf of the members and the board of the AADMD, it gives me great pleasure to install Marcus Welby MD as a bona fide AADMD hero. While his practice might have been limited to TV and a Hollywood soundstage, his approach to patients, his empathy, and his interest in understanding the meaning and burden of disease and disability and its impact on both the patient and the physician, we welcome Marcus Welby, MD, as our newest inductee to the revered AADMD Heroes community. Stay tuned for next year's Foundations in Developmental Medicine. And if you have anyone that you wish to nominate as an AADMD hero, please let me know. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Dr. Rader. You never surprised me at what you come up with and the detail and the information. I never thought the Dr. Welby that way, but uh, you are my Dr. Welby. You are Marcus Welby in my eyes. Thank you for all you do. And, uh, and, you're, and you're, you are the mentor for me and uh, healthcare. So uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rader. My pleasure. Okay.